very much for coming to today's event, hosted by the School of Humanities and Faculty of Arts at the University of Brighton. During the next hour, we're going to be talking to David Peace, we're going to be hearing some readings from his novels, and we're also going to be having an author of the UFA, the audience. Now, for some of you, I know David Peace doesn't really need any introduction, but for everyone else, here it is. From Premier League football and police politics to Japanese crime and British industrial disputes, the novels of David Peace offer occult accounts of 20th century history. The novels of his Red Riding Quartet confront the secret past of Yorkshire and the UK during the 1970s and 80s. Exploring the darker side of humanity and society, the quartet spans the north of England to chronicle an alternative account of the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper and the political ascendancy of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Peace followed the Red Riding Quartet to a chronological step in his 2004 novel GB84. Published to coincide with the 20th anniversary of the UK miners' strike, GB84 confronts industrial conflict and political tensions in the 1980s. Developing narrative seeds sown in the Red Riding Quartet, the novel draws attention to the legacies of Thatcherism and its intrinsic role in shaping the subsequent decades. In his next novel, David focused on a specific period in not only social, cultural and political history, but also in sporting history. 2006 saw the publication of The Damned United, a fictional reappraisal of football manager Brian Clough's 44 days in charge of Leeds United. Defamiliarising popular understandings of infamous historical characters and events, The Damned United sets Clough's failure at Leeds against his former success at Derby and a tale of past glories and present conflicts. This pervading interest in the very problematic relationship between past and present reached the pinnacle in the Tokyo Trilogy, a series of three novels addressing the rise and fall of post-war Japan. Since the publication of his first novel, David's work has quickly achieved critical acclaim. Grantham magazine named him as one of the best young novelists alongside rising stars of contemporary British literature, including Monica Ali, Sarah Waters and Philip Hedger, which we were discussing earlier. To date, he has won numerous prizes for his work, and Melbourne Bride has recently claimed that David is one of the strongest voices in contemporary British fiction. In recent years, his work has also been translated onto television and film. British Broadcast Channel 4 adapted the Red Riding Quartet in March 2009, and this went on to achieve a theatrical release in American cinemas. In the same year, The Damned United was adapted into a film starring Michael Shee as troubled football manager Brian Clough. Raking over uncomfortable histories, the canon of David Peace deliberately examines controversial people and contentious periods. Operating at the interface of fact and fiction, his texts break the surface of received histories. Addressing the many and contradictory demands of history, of reality, truth and causality, as well as the confusions and debates that mask the power operating beneath historical narratives, his novels bleed fact into fiction as part of a wider move towards an evolving understanding of our past. You please welcome David Peace. <laughs> now, David's going to start today with a brief reading. Yeah, this match is not that brief. Oh, okay, that's, that's fine. <laughs> uh, th thank thanks, Kate, for that introduction and for the uh, university for inviting me here, and thanks to you all for coming. I'm going to read uh, first from my novel GB84, which is a novel about the miners' strike uh, of 84 85. A, in this novel, I wanted to try to encompass the enormity of the strike um, from top to bottom, from left to right. In order to do that, I used many different narrative voices, so I'm not going to explain it anymore, but I'm just going to kind of read excerpts from the book to show about the different kind of voices in the book. Now, beginning with David Peace, we're going to go back to 1984, the GB84 you just read from, and that period of you growing up. <coughs> in Yorkshire. How influential was that in forming your ideas about literature and <coughs> politics? Um, well, I think the whole, I mean, I mean, ab absolutely fundamentally, really. Uh, I think, um, but I think it probably took me to move to Tokyo to start writing Red Riding to, to understand what, what that, what that, you know, what that meant to me. Um, I mean, personally, during this, I mean, during the, um, I mean, I, I came from a, or come from a very solid Labour family. Um, you know, I, a family that goes with, with, a, with a strong mining, not, not my immediate family, but a strong mining tradition in the family. So when the strike um, started, there was no question of who you would support, and um, 
and you know it was a solid the Wakefield area was very very solid um, but I, I, I you know I was 17 18 doing my A levels during the strike and I you know by the end of us you know particularly once we got once we got beyond the Christmas of the strike I you know like a lot of people I think got kind of sick and tired of it and wished it would kind of end and go away um, and there was a sense of, although it was, you know, kind of this inevitable defeat, and I think then I just wanted it to happen, and then when it had happened, I then I, I think I, like a lot of people, fell into a kind of political apathy. And then in, in, when I moved to Turkey and I started writing Red Riding Quartet, it, I really did want the books. Initially, I wanted the minor strike, then the Red Riding Quartet, but I thought that was a great. This, the more I wrote about it, um, the Yorkshire Ripper case and, and that whole era, era of police corruption. Although there are a lot of links between the minor strike in terms of personalities and, and on the police and people who are involved in a Ripper and investigation and the strike, I thought it was a disservice to the strike to, to try and tag it onto the end of this Red Riding Quartet. And so also I think during, right, but the more I wrote the Red Riding Quartet, I think I kind of it rekindled my kind of this, like, political awareness, consciousness. And when I came to write this book, GB84, um, I, I mean, I didn't, as, I, as I've said before, I, I, I had a growing sense of both anger and also guilt towards myself for how much I had really, you know, I, I, I just felt that during the strike I just paid lip service to it and um, not fully appreciated the levels of sacrifice for people and, and, and also suffering and oppression that people who were very near to me had gone through at that time, um, and and it, it and it made me, you know, obviously writing it made me go back and revisit the, the you know that time and, um, and and the politics of that time and and, and you know say it was, but but it was really written out of a sense of anger and guilt. Really. What about the literature at that time? What were you reading in those years? Well. What, during the strike? Mm. Well, I was, you see, I was reading, probably at that time, when I was 17 to 18, I was, I was reading, I was not reading, I'd gone through a period growing up, like, basically my reading went through, like, when I was a little kid, I, uh, the first books I really fell in love with were kind of like Sherlock Holmes novels, and also like Roald Dahl and things, like prior to that, Roald Dahl, and then Sherlock Holmes, and then crime fiction, and then my dad was a big uh, reader of, like, like Stan Barstow, John Brain, David Story, Alan Shirley, to the kind of northern working class writers. But to be honest, by the time of the strike, 84, 85, I was probably reading more kind of like Beckett and Burroughs and um, trying to read Dostoevsky and things like, you know, like I kind of, yeah, I, I was a big reader of the NME. And I don't know if people remember, but in, in, in the 1980s, the enemy was quite a hard read. And, and <laughs> you, they, they would like have a review of, say, the birthday party, and they would start with like a Dostoevsky quote. And in those days, you couldn't Google it or anything. So, you'd, <laughs> so you'd have, I'd have to go to the library or to Austin's bookshop in Leeds and try and find those books, really. So I was, it was kind of, it was really kind of, uh, literature I still like, but for want of a better phrase, more avant-garde literature than, than, the, than the kind of literature I'd kind of grown up with earlier. And um, then actually I came back to. No one particular book that you can put down has had any influence you? In terms of this book? Mm, in terms of GBH book. Ah, well, in the writing of it. Mm. Ah, well, in the writing of it, the book that influenced me the most was um, uh, Dos Passos' um, USA trilogy. Because when, when I came to actually write it, I, um, you know, as I said when I was in, trying to introduce a book, I, it, I really wanted, you know, obviously, I mean, the, this strike was, was I, I think, one of the most, possibly the most momentous event that happened in post-war, has happened to this country in, since, since the end of the war. Um, you know, there, there was 600,000 members of the union to begin with, and then there's the whole, the, 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 the and then there's obviously the people who work for the union, the people who work for the coal board, the people who were affected, who like um, in shops and pubs in the villages, and then the numbers of police that were involved, the security services. So, you know, there were millions of people directly involved. I mean, everybody who was living during that time will remember what it, what, what, how it dominated the news and the media at that time. And I thought, you know, I, 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 you know, 
I wanted to write a novel that tried to encompass the enormity of that strike, and I thought it's, it's simply not possible with one narrative voice. And so it's going to take, you know, as I say, I wanted to do it from the top, from both the top of the union, the top of the coal board, the government, the security services, right down to how it affected like people who were on strike, people who broke the strike, people on the political left, people on the political right. And I thought, how, how am I going to do? I'm not going to do this with one voice, one, one narrator happening to run into all these different people coincidentally. Um, and, and actually, Dos Passos' USA trilogy, I thought, was a, a good example of the different ways he could... I mean, he uses kind of like camera eyes and newspapers and, and so forth and different texts and, and so different ways of setting the text in terms of fonts and, and so forth. And that was quite an inspiration, really, in terms of how to put, put the book together. And GB84, alongside your other work, kind of sets up this wider project of almost remapping the norm. And I know it's a lot of the students who studied your work here, and particularly students I know in America who have not been to the north of England, mm -hmm. they feel like they have been to the north for your work. Is that not a hell of a responsibility? Well, right? it's, so it's not exactly your tourist work. No, so. <laughs> it's not, no. And, and it, it is a great responsibility, yeah. But, and also, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think, you know, these are very much novels, although I'm, although I'm talking about historical events, they really are novels. And I wouldn't ever want that kind of, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I'm obviously I'm very grateful if anybody reads this book, but I wouldn't want them to think they actually know then the minor strike. And that's why, you know, in, latterly I start to put, like in this book, um, bibliographies of, of texts I used. Um, I mean, what I would hope is that this book would make people curious enough to find out more about the strike. And I wouldn't want people to think, oh, right, I know about my, you know, what I would like, you know, what, it, what I call the Schindler's List way of looking at history. Like, you watch a Schindler's List and you think you know about the Holocaust, that kind of thing. Um, but, it, but there is that danger, yeah, and that, that people are going to read it. But, but it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, it is, but it is a responsibility, yeah. And there was some controversy when GBA4 was released because it was published in the 20th anniversary year yeah. of the strike. And there were quite a few commentators that commented on that particular timing. <coughs> yeah, well, that, that, that was, um, actually, I mean, I have to say, I, I was, um, there was much more controversy over that book, uh, which I think is quite sad, really. <laughs> <laughs> if it's going to be a controversy, it should be over that book, really. But, but, um, Why do you think that was? Why do you think that football managers suddenly created a lot more controversy than the biggest industrial dispute in post war Well, and also, and also with Red Riding, yeah. with police corruption. I really thought police corruption. Um, and, and you know, Circus Tale when they published Red Riding were be really, really worried about litigation from West Yorkshire Police, and none came. Faber were very worried about you know, like what, like what both the coal board and the union, such as it was, would make of this book, and, and nothing ever happened to us. And actually, this book, the Damned United, nobody kind of thought you know <laughs> anything would happen, but obviously we were sued. So and it was much more. <laughs> And obviously football is a much more controversial topic in this country. But, but I think with the timing, I was always quite nervous about the timing because the book was written, the book was ready and finished before the anniversary. But Faber, you know, such is the way publishers they want, they thought it was a good, it would be, um, it would be, you know, good to time it to the anniversary, there'd be more interest and people would be more likely to read it and so forth. Um, and I, I actually thought that maybe, it will be lost in a kind of deluge of mining, mining and, and minor strife type things. But actually, I, I actually think there's more. There's been more interest at that time. The 20th anniversary was um, 2004. It was this is pre rack It's still New Labour and it's kind of like reasonably honeymoon period. And I don't think there was, to be honest, there wasn't a great. I mean, you say it was contract, but there wasn't a great deal of interest. More about mining. Right, yeah, yeah. Whereas the 25th anniversary? Well, in 25th anniversary, the book, I mean, the, the, the book, I mean, you know, I mean, not, not that this is the, the, the measure of everything, but the book has sold, say, more in the last year than it sold in the first four years put together. So I don't... Do you think that's something kind of you've packaged as part of that revolutionary writing? No, I don't, no, I don't, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, no, I, I, I think, having read from the play, having done a lot of events in the last... 18 months around with, with this book and stuff, I just think that, I think that the people, I think this, you know, 
obviously the political, the political situation in this country has shifted dramatically since 2004 to, to, to you know, now. And, um, and I, just, I just think people find a greater, maybe possibly a greater relevance in, in, in strike and the lessons of strike or uh, um, are more interested in it. It's interesting you say that because a big comment from students when we when we look at your novels and lectures is about the 21st century resonance of a lot, a lot of the things that you're writing about. A lot of essentially about the past, yeah. particularly the issues like Iraq in the Tokyo trilogy and also yeah. GDS4. Hmm. Have you noticed this particularly from younger readers? Did well, I, I mean, I, one of the reasons I wrote this G B eighty four was for because I felt this was kind of get I thought this 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 moment of history was was getting lost. It was getting rewritten, not rewritten. It was getting written out of history, and it wasn't. You know, as I say, I was writing it. So I began writing it about two thousand. So I was writing it two thousand one to two thousand and three, and it was a period when you know I I felt that you know like a lot of people I'm sure that when 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 Blair took office. After all those years of Conservative government, I thought they were going to kind of, for example, with trade union legislation, employment laws, they were going to kind of move back to something that was a little bit more sympathetic to working people, and they didn't do anything. And and this this whole strike was just not convenient. The, the, the right had never been proud of what went on from the strike at all, and that nor have like the, 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 the Labour Party, and and it just seemed to be being ignored and. I'm not, I always say Billy Elliot, but I'm not actually knocking Billy Elliot because at least it brought it to some degree to, to people's attention. But there was this kind of this kind of banners and brass band sentimentality attached to the strike, but not actually. There was no, um, I thought, no national kind of awareness of, of it with, with younger people of actually what what the, what the security. Apparatus um, had what the, security, what, the, what the state had actually done to the people, um, to, to, to the mining communities, and that was why, you know, the, I mean, the book has been criticised for not, for example, focusing on more on say the the, 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 the women's sport groups and various and, and the other sport groups that went, you know, obviously helped keep the strike going for as long as it did. But I felt that at that time was documented, but not the level of. You know, surveillance, oppression, and violence that would rain down on the mining communities. And I, and I do think that um, from doing events around the country, that people are, younger people are, are, you know, they don't know very much about this period and they are curious about it. Mm. Do you think it's because of the general criticisation of students, the way that coalition governments and. Well, I think things. prior to that, I think it was just, I mean, again, it's just a kind of. Um, you know, the people were not, you know, you know, people were not, you know, this is 25 years ago, so if you're 19 years old, you would have no, how are you going to know about it? So it's just a kind of not knowing about it um, and being interested in, and I mean, I haven't got a copy here, but I did this introduction to the, uh, I did an introduction to a book of photographs taken at Easington during the strike, and that particularly, with the things we've done in, in the north of England with, Around these photographs again, which we've been into schools with children, and that's been very interesting to, to, to talk to them about what went on. You know, particularly when you're going to you're visiting places in County Durham or Yorkshire, former mining communities where there is like absolutely now no like the, the, the entire landscape has been altered. So there's no real trace of what, of what went on in those villages before, let alone the strike. Mm, scary. When yeah. you go back. Yeah. Now, unlike your other novels, G B S Four hasn't been adapted to screen yet. Can we expect that? Well, it is being adapted. It is. It, no. Yeah, yeah, but I don't know. Um, it's 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 not. There's no. It, the scripts have been written for Channel Four, but there's no date on when we'll start filming. How happy were you with the other adaptations? I know the Damned United, the film, almost kind of bridged the novel and the controversy <coughs> around the novel. Well, I did. I mean. Um, I was very, I was very, very happy with the, not happy, very, very proud of the Red Riding um, trilogy. Um, the Damned United um, can always sound a bit, sound a bit churlish to me, but I didn't, I, did, I, um, I didn't. I, when, when the Damned United was published, there was, um, 
a, a couple of different directors were inter interested in, in adapting it, and one of them was Stephen Frears. And that was the option we went with. And Stephen Frears um, wrote a letter to, 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 to me and the publisher saying, I would really want to adapt this book, and I want to make it as a kind of black and white homage to Lindsay Anderson's This Sporting Land. Now, the novel, This Sporting Land by David Story, was a huge influence on, 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 on the writing of the book, and so I thought this would be a brilliant, yeah, this time would be great. But unfortunately, and there are two accounts of what happened, Stephen Free has left the project. One account is because he didn't like the script, one account is that he got a better offer from Hollywood to do something else. And anyway, so basically, we, we the, 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 it, it went to a different director, and uh, I don't think it was quite. I don't think it was quite what, what it could have been, personally. And that's very churlish, because, because obviously a lot of people bought the book having seen the film, which I'm very grateful for. Yeah. Should we have a second reading? Yeah, so I'm going to read from a Dan Janine now. <clears throat> No, not really. No, I think, I know. I, I, you know, I hope all the time, yeah. I, I think football, no, I'd like to write about football again. What about the end of the Tokyo trilogy? Because that was quite a step back in terms of chronology to post-war Japan. What drew you there in particular? Well, I mean, um, I mean, I, I mean if, I, if I'd never moved to Tokyo, I, wouldn't, I don't want to, I mean, it was basically, um, you know, I lived there for 15 years, and um, I was just fascinated, as much for my, my children as myself, about the history of the city and how, how this city that had been destroyed by an earthquake in 1923 had been bombed flat in 1945, how this, you know, as well as the rest of the country, how this, how this city had um, built itself up, um, and, and to the city it is now, and that, and, and that was what drew me to, to write about the city, and I think. Um, you know, to go back as well to try to use, as I had done with Red Riding, but to use like true crime to tell the story of of of, of different of different kinds of the political, the economic, the social history interwoven with the crimes that, that brought the city back up to what it is. So what was it like writing in Tokyo about Tokyo? Because hitherto you've written about the UK in Tokyo. Well, I think that I, I think it was important for me. Um, I mean, I think because I was when I wrote Red Riding, G Gate, or Madame Damned United, I was writing about England in the past, yeah. and it was a past I'd lived through, and I thought it was important, and I, I think it was useful for me to be away to have that distance, particularly because I, I was trying in the books always to capture, recapture the language of that of the time I was writing about, and. I think, you know, as we know, language changes all the time so much, and it was, I think, I, had, I think those books would have been difficult to write still in this country, because I think I would have been probably too distracted by what was happening in the present, really. Um, and um, Tokyo, though, I mean, this was, you know, the first time I was writing about a time and place that I hadn't lived in and through, um, Tokyo of, like, the, the American occupation. And so I think actually it was more important to actually be there in order to, you know, when I was writing Tokyo Year Zero, an occupied city, I mean, it was still possible to look at old maps and to walk, to walk the city and, to, and you can still, you know, see, you know, to try to find the kind of hidden city. That, I think for me, if that, that was important to actually be there while I was writing. And you're coming to a close without that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, the third Tokyo book is called The Exorcists. And um, we'll be finished quite soon, I hope, yeah. Excellent. Now, we've talked about a lot in terms of you as a contemporary novelist, but I suppose one obvious question is why the novel as a form in particular would be a bit tempted to stray off into other forms? Um, I, I mean, actually, the, the, the form that I like, the form I feel more naturally than any other is actually poetry, and I tend to write. I tend to write in kind of quite fragmented, kind of little, like, it comes as lines, really. Um, and then to try to put it 
together as a novel is so it's kind of putting the fragments together. So I'm always, you know, I, I write a lot of poetry if you like as a hobby. Um, and I also, I do, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm also, you know, I'm also interested in, you know, in also in, in, in plays and theatre as well. I think there's a lot. Um, but for, for, for now, I think it's, I just want to concentrate for now on the novel, really. But I'm not, not, not interested in what you see what you You can't extract the volume of poetry in this essay. Not, 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 Excellent. Well, can we throw this out to the audience? We've got questions there, if you could raise your hands. I'd like to thank you, first of all, I read six of your novels. Thank you, thank you. GBA4, if it came like an addiction, uh, a literary speed, I'd have another one, I'd have to pick up another one. <laughs> But then I thought I've got to wean myself off this because this speed is starting to do my head in, you know. It seems kind of almost relentless. And my other sort of doubt that was forming was that the attitudes of women, they seem to be very peripheral right. as interesting objects. In fact, they, in many of the books, they seem to be objects which were just there to be violently penetrated. So I wonder now you're living back in Tokyo, which is a pretty frenetic city, and I think they have a pretty appalling attitude to both young women and older women. Uh, will there be a change of pace or attitude, or are you plugged into this? No. I, I, yeah, no, this, is, this has come up a, a few times, and we've discussed this, uh, you know, and it's criticism of the books. I, you know, and it, with the Red Riding Quartet particularly, and then with GB84 and the Damned United, I, I was writing about very, very masculine cultures. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I see particularly Red Riding as a critique of misogynist attitudes in the north of England during that period of time. Um, and, and also, you know, within the Red Riding Quartet, there's also a lot of racism. Actually, I've never ever asked about the racism. I'm always asked about the sexism. But, you know, I think to write about those times, you know, it's not possible to, you know, I can't, you know, that, that the misogyny of the political, the way I see it, the misogyny of the West Yorkshire police, and for example, the local journalists who were writing about, say, the Yorkshire Ripper case, I think contributed to, to certainly the, um, from failing to stop it for, for the length of time, for the length of time we went on. I think, I, I think that, it's, it's, I mean, it's not just the police, what I was trying to show the book was not just the police and the journalists, it was something endemic in that society at that time. So, I mean, there's some women very many favours in Yorkshire, when I say it, but I would, you know, to some degree, then society, the society in which the crimes took place is put at people of the society are culpable. Um, but the language of, and, and still to some degree, it's, you know, I've mean, been back in West Yorkshire for two years, I would say it's better than it was. But it's still, you know, for example, whenever Leeds United lose, domestic violence cases rise 50% in Leeds. That's still a fact. And it's, you know, there's still a certain misogyny of the language. You know, people are still routinely referred to as silly cows or, you know, it's a very kind of casual misogyny. It, you know, I don't, it might be the same all over England, but that's the, that's the place I know. Um, and to me, writing about writing, there was no way to get around that. But um, is it not possible that if you don't get to know them as people, or women, they do just become objects? It's because you don't know who they are necessarily. Well, 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 people walk around dark alleys and get stabbed. Well, I, I and in GB84, uh, a lot of women were politicised during that time. They ran the villages yeah, while the men yeah, were off yeah, and and this or collecting money around yeah, the country. Yeah, and this is what I think this is a very legitimate criticism of GB84. Um, as, as I said before, I mean, I, at that time I was writing it. I, I felt that the, the strike was, the, the, what, what was well documented about the strike was the role of women's support groups. And there was this kind of notion on the left that the strike, although we lost, it was all right because women became politicized and women went to university and minors women went out and hung around with people from Green and Common and all of this kind of, and, 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 that, and that is, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, that, that to me was documented. But what I was trying to show in the book was simply the, the kind of brutality of the of the state apparatus on the mining communities. And actually, there are must, there are there were women characters in the book. I don't think they are. I don't think you would argue they were particularly weak of the women characters in the book. Um, but but I think you know 
it, it was one of the reasons why I, was, I very much wanted to do this, um, the text that accompanied these photographs, was to go back to either kind of to redress the balance with this book no redemption of the mind. Because I, think, I do feel, although I think they had a legitimate reason at the time, I do think it's one of the problems in the book. It's not, while I say it was top to bottom, left to right, there is a kind of little bit of a hole there. Um, so I mean, with, and I mean, with, with the Tokyo trilogy, again, particularly with the second book, Occupied City, there are, there are in there, I think, very strong female voices in that book. And I think that was the big challenge to me in that book, was to write, you know, there are, there are three separate narrative voices that are, are by uh, the voices of women, which was a challenge to me. But having said that, they also exist in 1980, or right, they, are the, they are the voices of the victims. But I very much wanted to put those voices in there to, to, to not just disregard the victims and not just to have them as like, a, you know, like the typical crime novel where they're, where they're, they're, they're the kind of start of the game or something. So, I mean, it's, I'm very conscious of this, yeah. With the Damned United, there was just really, you know, with the Damned United, um, what backfired on me was, well, I don't know if it backfired on me or not, but, but it, I didn't really want to bring Brian Clough's wife into it because I thought she was a private figure, so I kind of kept her out of it to avoid upsetting them, that didn't work, so. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much. I, I stopped after the first of the trip, so I'll have to buy a second one now. <laughs> no, it's the one, the but, no, but it was, I, I, there are, there are, there are in there, but there is, um, there is one, the voice of one of the survivors is the voice of a woman, and there is also at the end the voices of the, of, the, of, the, of the mothers and the sisters and the daughters as well. So, I mean, I really, because I was very conscious that this was a, a kind of, something that was missing. Thank you. Thank you. Was the Red Riding book something that was in your mind before you moved to Japan? Was there something about being in Japan that made that sort of almost shook that loose and dislodged that and gave you this gave you the impetus that you needed to, to start writing those? Like, did did they come out of out of out of the experience of being far away from home and being in a strange new place? Um, I, I, when, when I was in, when I was a, I went to Manchester Poly. Um, before I went to Manchester Poly, and when I was at Manchester Poly, I was writing, I wrote two novels and, and a couple of screenplays. And one of those did concentrate quite a bit on, on the Yorkshire Ripper case. So, that, so it was something that was always there. Um, when, I then went to Istanbul for, for a couple of years and didn't do any writing in Istanbul. And then when I went to Tokyo, um, I. In, in Tokyo, I just didn't know, I didn't really know very many people and I had quite a bit of, you know, because the way I was teaching English was a foreign language and, it, and the course began, at, the, the teaching I did started at one and ended at nine and in the mornings I had time and, and I wanted to basically just write the book I wanted to read and I, I, I was very influenced initially by um, particularly at Elroy's LA Quartet in terms of going back and looking at your own childhood, and also I suppose Walter Mosley was another influence, and that kind of new wave of American crime writing, um, not only Elroy, but like James Lee Burke, Andrew Bax, and James Crumbly, they'd all kind of come up at that time, and I'd read a lot of them. And I kind of basically ran out of books to read, and thought I wanted to go do what they did, which was to go back, I mean, I think that generation of American crime writers, what they did was to, was to locate crimes in very different, definite places. And I wanted to go back to a time and place I grew up in and write about that. And so the kind of Tokyo, it had been there before, obviously growing up during the Ripper case, I mean, I'd, I'd written about it, you know, unsuccessfully when I was in Manchester. But I think it was Tokyo gave me the kind of, I think not knowing people, and I think, you know, I think that gave me, and, and, and also, the, the, a lot to do with it was the work, really, having the time to have that kind of like, I had like a good five hours every morning in which to write. I just started to write and write, and that's how it started, really. Quick follow-up question, why, what was it about being in Istanbul where you were not writing? Why, why do you think that was? Well, I think, well, it was partly, it was two things. I, I'd been in Manchester, and, and, and after I finished, the, I finished in uh, 91, and, and the book, I'd been writing a book while I was at Manchester Poly and that book had been rejected. 91 to 92, I, I, I finished another novel which I didn't even bother to send out and I'd also done these screenplays and a play and various other things. And all this stuff was rejected. 
And so I'd really have like about three years of total rejection, and honestly, from every publisher in this country. <laughs> uh, and I went to Istanbul because I was, un I was, you know, in Manchester, I was unemployed, I had student loans, um, debt, and I had nothing, you know, I know, and I, and I basically, in Istanbul, I, had to, I was working like, the, the, the look, from nine in the morning till like nine at night, just taking as many hours as I could to kind of pay off the debts, really. I mean, because I, I couldn't pay off the debts, because the Turkish economy, I'm sorry, this is probably not really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the Turkish economy was not very good at that time. And so I realised I was working, 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 not being able to pay off the debts. And so the guy I shared a flat with in Istanbul, he'd been teaching in Japan. So he said, well, if you go to Japan, you can pay off these debts in a year, which was true. Because when I started at this really horrible language school in Tokyo, I started on more a month, and my dad was earning his primary school head teacher, so I was able to pay it off and also start writing again. But actually, I think the two years in Istanbul not writing was quite useful, actually, because I think I'd got into a kind of rut with the writing I was doing in Manchester. Thank you. Um, just want to second all. Thank you very much, and to the Canadian School of Humanities for inviting you. I want to ask a question um, which is um, a bit unfair, so feel free to reject if there might be better questions. It's unfair because it's not to do with the work you've done, but the work that, um, that I wish you would do. Um, <laughs> Casey um, described you as um, reading <coughs> over uncomfortable histories, and I'm interested here, particularly in the stylistic innovations um, you demonstrated in GP84, which is a novel nothing I'd, I'd ever read before. And I do remember um, being provoked to buy the novel by a review, and the review said that this actually, your, the way the style um, through which you produced GP84, that was actually the only style that you could write about that particular event, about that particular year. You described yourself as a monumental event, but arguably the most important thing in, in post-war British history. I'm wondering how you would do it now, if you were to write about now, and arguably the stakes are as high, you know, in terms of what, not just working class um, people stand to lose, but all of us involved in what, you know, we like to call the, the public sector. Um, you know, there's an awful lot of people here who have been involved in, for example, the, the student demonstrations yeah, yeah. last year and March 26 <coughs> too. So this is, if you were to write, you know, which I, I think you'd be great if you were, um, about, say, everything since 2008, since the crash and then the election mm. of the, um, the Conservative, um, the Dem coalition, um, there is no event. There's no side in the sense like there were, you know, you have the, the bigger heads. Um, and arguably forces that yeah. are definable. Would you necessarily have to go and do, like you say, the many voices, you know, that otherwise get deep down inside? Or would there be another way? Would you go back to a realism or would you take a particular narrative voice? I think it, it's a very interesting question, but it's a very difficult question. And it's come up quite a bit when I've when I've spoken at, at like say Manchester University or Leeds University. I I you know, per personally, I think that the, the difficulty is about you're asking, you're basically saying it's about like a contemporary novel about contemporary times. Yeah, and I, I think that to me is that that is beyond me because I, I find I remember, I remember to give another example actually. I remember like you know after the after the um, Twin Towers in America. A lot of, a lot of, I remember a lot of writers, like for example, my name is Zadie Smith, and a lot of people started to write about this quite immediately afterwards. And I didn't know how we could do it because I don't, I think the, the problem for the novelist is you're not a journalist. And I, I find the difficulty is you have to kind of see, to some degree, you have to, you have to look for the narrative to form. Um, and, and it, and it it takes a while, and I mean, if you look at like, I mean, okay, this might say, you, you can, you might argue they're not very great writers, I mean, but for example, um, Sebastian Forks wrote his book A Week in December, Ian McCune wrote that book about like, and it's just rubbish, really. Let's be honest, they're just shit books, and it's I don't, I don't know if that's a failure of them as writers or if actually it's just too deep because the you. You need a certain amount of distance, surely, as a novelist. And I think as well, to be honest, I think the way, the, 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 you know, I think it's even harder now. Because an event, like you, as you say, it's almost like there's no event. It's like, it, it's so fragmented and, um, you know, if you, if you take, if you take something like, 
some of the student, student protests in London are, you know, like the two major ones. I mean, how did people fall at that? I mean, it's not like the miners' strike, to be honest, where, okay, but the, the, me, the media were manipulating it, but actually it was a very small media. But, but you know, with, with the things we're seeing now, the media is so dispersed. It, it, I, I don't, it, I, I, you know, you're gonna need even more, but I, I don't, it's, I think, I, I mean, I really hope people, I wish people would write about it, and, and I, wish, I really wish they would, but for me, I would have to wait to get some degree of perspective on it. I think it's almost, if you're too close, you can't see the, the, bigger, the bigger picture. So that's a retrospective making. <clears throat> yeah, I, it's, it's really, it's, it's quite, to, uh, but it's very, very interesting how, how you write about contemporary history in the forms of fiction. It, it, it's really, it's very, very interesting and, and challenging. And I'm not saying you can't or you shouldn't, I'm just saying it's beyond the way I, my methods don't work like that. I kind of have to wait for it to kind of a little bit of a, some, some distance from it, really. Um, but of course, like we alluded to before, I mean, I, I mean, I think that also, I think my GB84 says as much probably about the time I was writing it in as about the time I was writing about. And I, I think, for example, Tokyo Year Zero and Occupy the City are very, very much influenced by what was happening in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but, but that was not a conscious plan. I think that retro, I kind of think that retrospectively. I don't know, I don't know how, um, what, what everybody else feels about this. I mean, it's, um, you know, I mean, you know, publishers suddenly start talking about like a Twitter novel and this kind of, you know, these different kinds of media and, and how, and how it's, how it's going to shape the narratives and, and the way that people, you know, I, I've dealt with things that were actually, uh, if you think about, say, the Yorkshire Ripper case or the Miners' Strike, to give two examples, that were actually were actually presented to us in quite a limited media, not not like now. So do you think that's actually going to disabling contemporary novelists that we have Twitter and social networking yeah. and camera phones? But it, you know, if you're growing up, you know, if you were, you know, I, so I was 17 and 18 during the miners' strike. If someone's 17 and 18 now, they're going to be able to handle that media much better than I yeah. can. Is what I would hope, and present something that's more, you know something much better than I could do, I would hope. One link, I suppose, between those two periods is Thatcher, between then and now. Mm. Are you going to go back there? Yeah, I, 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 will, I will go back, yeah, to, yeah, after the Tokyo, third Tokyo book, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, to use a really horribly ubiquitous quote, um, Hamlet had no childhood. I've no problem in saying when reading Dan's Night Tip, you're Brian Clark, I no child. And um, obviously, the real Brian, Brian Clark did. Um, as far as I'm concerned, your book's after this, it should be considered in its own right. But when I'm reading Brian Clark's much tougher times at Leeds United, go out to sacking, I can't help but temper those thoughts with the idea that back to back European Cups are not in Christ, so European Cups is fine. Um, you say your books are fiction based on fact. How do you feel about readers using? other fact, extraneous to the sort of temporal limits of your books, um, in order to augment their reading? So I'm not, I'm not I can't, can't actually hear you very well, sorry. <coughs> How do you feel about readers using... Why I do put like the bibli bibliography in, I think, I think this book, um, The Damage Art is an interest, uh, is, is in interesting because, um, Obviously, you know, some people read it and they know a lot about football and they have the voice of Brian Clough and they know, as you said, that he's, that he's, you know, he goes on and he wins the European Cups. And obviously I knew that when I was writing that, but some people read it and they know nothing about football. So it's, I mean, there's very different, there's very different readings of the books. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not just saying it's out of like false humility. I'm, I'm just grateful if people read the book. So then, you know, people, people bring to it. I can't really, I, I, I obviously wrote it thinking that most of the people that would read it would, would know that, and I think it's kind of weighted at the end, but there is a little bit at the end where I do state in the European Cups, but it's a kind of... I don't know if it's about expectations, it's more about a case of whether it's sort of legitimate to do that as a reader. I, I, I'm not... I, 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 don't, 
I, I don't I, I, I don't think there's any um, this is kind of like I hope you answer this question but it's going off the target a bit so people often ask me like say with GB84 people say this book is very very hard on the reader don't aren't you like going to do but when I write the books and this can get me I don't have a reader in mind. The reader is me. Because I can't possibly, every reader is going to be completely different. And so I can't imagine who they are or what they know or what they don't know. So I only write it as if I'm going to read it, as if I can understand it. And sometimes that might work and sometimes it doesn't. With, with this book, I, I put that last, um, you know, the very last bit of the argument too says, you know, in May 1979, Margaret Hill, the faction of Conservative Party, won the general election, and Brian Howard thought that Nottingham Forest will be European Court, no no, 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 Blake, no, Orwell, the UFC. I put that in just in case people didn't know what happened. But but obviously, when I'm when I'm getting to the end of the book, as a, as you know, as me as the writer and the first reader, I know what happens next, and I think it's. I don't think it's. Good, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that what 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 you you know, I'm hoping if you if you if you know the story of Brian Cook, it works, and if you don't know the story of Brian Cook, it works. Really, that's not a cop out. That's really honestly what I feel. So. Does that answer the question? Final question there. It wasn't so much a question as uh, an observation in the sense of what you've just been describing, because. Um, you're very historically orientated, which has great for some historian. Um, but the history doesn't stand still. I mean, you know, I can think of at least four books on Clough and Levy that have come out probably since the film more than the text, as it were, not to mention Johnny Giles. You probably have a super injunction, actually, these days, if you, if you weren't careful. Just as you know, in uh, theoretically, in three years' time, uh, we should have access to a lot of the government papers about the strike. Yeah. I suspect the great deal of your characterization yeah. will be true. The real yeah. secret one will stay fairly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can't, I, I don't think you pretend to no. sort of define American history and leave it. You're part of that history. Well, You're part of our cultural awareness of the past. Well, well that's, you know, that is, a, and actually that's something I hadn't really thought. But I mean, I hadn't thought that like the G84 would then form part of the history of the strike. I hadn't actually thought of that before. But I do, but I mean, I mean, the reason why. I do use this for the not the novel is because it's you know I'm I'm, I'm not anti-history. I mean, so one of my greatest heroes is Christopher Hill, the historian. We all have weaknesses. But but I but I, I'm always mistrustful of the way that particularly in this day and age, you know, but like you know, Simon Shamer is you know he is the voice of history, and we all have to bow down, and that's all there is to it. And I just refuse to accept that. And so, you know, I think there's rooms for for, for, for fictions about history, and, it, and, 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 and 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 as almost a way to start a dialogue and a national conversation. Really, what what you know, I suppose, if I had any ambition for the for not the dungeon, sorry, if I had any ambition for GB84 was it would start people to talk. Whether they agreed or disagreed to talk about the issues of the strike raised, um, you know, and that, 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 as you say, you know, that history is not fixed; that it's moving, and that it's and it's, it's very much, you know, a, a, you know, a, a fluid narrative. Okay, well, just join me in thanking David. Please. Thank you.